Hi, everyone. I just want to confirm, can you see my slide? It should be uh, showing now. It's great to be here. I'm uh, calling in from the West Coast, so it's a little on the early side for me, so that's why I'm not sharing video. Uh, my name's Eddie Glenn. I work for a company called Venify, and uh, just a little bit about me before I get started. I uh, started off my career as a software developer developing avionics software. So I spent many, many years uh, concerned about software that, that controls aircraft and uh, making sure that it's safe and secure. And over time, my uh, career just kind of le led me towards uh, being more security focused. So uh, very happy to be here today to talk about software supply chains. Um, before I get started, I, I wanted to tell a story. And there's this company in Europe called Maersk. They're the world's largest shipping conglomerate. And um, they're responsible for a fifth of the world's shipping capacity. It's a huge company, uh, lots of employees, lots of different offices spread around the world. And uh, they had a really bad day on June 27, 2017. And I don't know if that date rings a bell for any of you, but uh, something really bad happened at Maersk that, uh, that impacted a lot of people around the world. And basically what happened is their employees started seeing screens that looked like this on their computers. And what had happened is that they had been uh, hit by the NotPetya malware. And uh, 4,000 of their servers got infected, 45,000 PCs got infected. It basically wiped out all the data on all of their computers. Their voice over IP phones stopped working. Um, their ships stopped moving. The port terminal gates stopped moving up and down so their, their customers couldn't get product through the, the, the port. And this ended up affecting not just Maersk, but obviously all of the customers that depended on them for their worldwide shipping activities. And uh, it took them about 10 days to, to get everything rebooted to where they were operational again. And their internal accountants said that it had cost them $300 million. But uh, some external experts thought that it was probably maybe double or triple that for them based on uh, the number of days that they had downtime. So extremely serious incident for Maersk. And I'm sure that their leadership uh, will always remember that, that particular day. But it didn't affect just them. It affected other global companies. Uh, Merck Pharmaceuticals was in the news in the U.S. My brother works for, for Merck, and uh, he, he wasn't able to work for about two weeks because they were experiencing similar things. And, and this happened with um, the subsidiary of FedEx in Europe. And the list goes on with, with other companies that were, that were impacted by it. And uh, the estimate for the number of damages done worldwide by this one piece of malware was $10 billion. So extremely significant uh, amount, of, amount of money and uh, impact on companies and companies' workers. So how did it happen? And this is what I wanted really to focus on today is, is the how it happened and uh, how, what steps we can take to keep this from happening to businesses like yours. So it turns out that there was a small family-run Ukrainian software business called LinkOS, and they produced a piece of software called MeDoc that's basically used by all businesses that do business with U Ukraine. So all of these global companies did business with Ukraine, so they had this piece of software. And uh, we all know what was going on and has been going on between Russia and Ukraine uh, for a number of years, and hackers uh, within uh, the Russian military infected uh, this piece of software with the Notpetya malware, and that ended up infecting everyone uh, that used it. And this is really, you know, an, an important question that so far I've not been able to find the answer to, but if if Link OS was doing proper code signing uh, practices, that shouldn't have been possible, but it was. So obviously there was some problem with code signing, and that's what I really want to talk to you guys about today to help educate you on the importance of how to do proper code signing within your organization. So when we think about the risk that we have from a security perspective, there, there are two risks that are on the uh, different sides of the same coin. First, you have the company, the Ukrainian company, company Link, Linkos, and their risk was around, do they protect the software that they delivered to their customers adequately? And did they infect their customers, which they did. 
So that, you know, that's a huge risk for, especially for those of you that work for businesses where software is your primary product. But then there's also the risk that you have to think about from Maersk, where if they got infected with, with malware, uh, it's going to disrupt their business operations. And, you know, when I, when I talk to our customers, I frequently say, well, which of these risks is more palatable to your business? Which are you, you're willing to, to bear? And, and most companies say, well, neither. Uh, they're both, both extremely uh, important and um, things that I want to avoid. So this kind of leads us to the question uh, about software chains, software supply chains. They're more vulnerable than ever. And there are a number of reasons for that. First is that our businesses rely on software more than they've ever relied on software before. Uh, you know, if you go back to Maersk and, and think about, you know, their, their port gates going up and down. I mean, they stopped working because they were controlled by software. Their voice over IP phones stopped working because they're controlled by software. So um, businesses rely on software more than ever. The other important aspect is that the software comes from many different suppliers. So if, if I'm a part of the InfoSec team, I, I you know, look at the inventory of software that my, my company uses, and I would, I would guess that maybe 100 to 200, maybe 500 different vendors provide your company software. And how do you know that all of that software is trustworthy and that it comes from the source that it says it comes from? Another aspect is that we're downloading software from the internet every day. And your employees are downloading software from the internet every day. So how do you trust uh, that software that's being downloaded? And then finally, but, and it's not, li and it's certainly not least here, cyber criminals are more active and creative than ever before. And, and we'll see that uh, later on in, in, in my talk here. So there are other examples where malware has uh, infected a very critical pieces of software based on poor code signing practices and policies. Uh, just a year ago, uh, the Taiwanese uh, computer manufacturer ASUS had a very severe issue around um, hackers uh, adding malware to their software updates. And I'm gonna dive into that in a little bit more detail in just a few minutes. And then if we go back a, a few years before that, you had the issue of, of Stuxnet uh, that uh, was, was uh, causing quite a few problems. And then here's the thing that if, if I were you, I'd really be concerned about is that code signing is an effective way to stop this malware from being uh, inserted into legitimate software. Hackers know that. So what are they doing now? They're focusing their attention on how do they steal uh, code signing certificates from legitimate companies. So if you work for company XYZ and you aren't protecting your code signing uh, private keys uh, sufficiently and a hacker steals those keys, they're going to be able to sign malware in your company's name. And McAfee did a research study uh, about two years ago, and they would found that 22 and a half million instances of malware were signed with either stolen or forged code signing certificates. So again, think about this. If, if uh, there's a piece of malware floating around the internet and it's signed with your company's code signing credentials, what's that going to mean to your company? What's your CEO going to think about that? So you know, keep this in mind that, that if your company is doing code signing, that you really need to focus on how do you protect those keys. So in the rest of the time that I have, I'll, I just want to do a couple of, couple of things. I'm going to go through a quick code signing refresher. I do uh, find many, many of the people that I talk to, they, they are aware of code signing, but they aren't really aware of the details of it. I'm going to talk about the challenges that uh, likely your organization is having. And then I'm going to finally give you some best practices on how you can uh, improve things. So first, what is uh, code signing? It's really just a, a technique that allows uh, someone to add a digital signature to computer executables. And when we talk about computer executables, we mean anything from the software applications that, that your employees install, OS, uh, images, uh, disk images, containers, um, firmware, drivers, you name it. If it's a piece of code and it executes on something, then that's a piece of code that potentially can be signed, digitally signed. And that signature is going to show you two things. It's going to show your, your consumers two things. One is it verifies your, your identity, your company's identity. And two, it verifies and ensures that no one has modified your software um, since you originally signed it. So, you know, let's say you put out a, a software update 
uh, a hacker, if it's been properly signed, a hacker can't uh, install malware or attach malware to it because then the digital signature will no longer match and uh, the operating system will reject it. So think about code signing as a birth certificate for the software. So just like with, with uh, human birth certificates, a uh, uh, code signing certificate and key is extremely vital to protecting the identity of the software that, that your business uh, consumes as well as uh, creates. So when we think about who signs code, and, and this is part of the problem that, that businesses have, it's kind of across the board. Um, if you think about who's actually writing the code, it's gonna be the software developers. And if you're like most of the businesses that I talk to, they, they have hundreds or thousands of software developers spread around the world. So you have lots of development going on uh, where they're, they're the ones responsible for, for signing, uh, signing their software. You have build engineers. You, uh, maybe people don't even do it and it's done by automated scripts. Um, uh, that's uh, being driven by something like Jenkins or another DevOps uh, kind of platform. But uh, code signing, you know, could be done uh, by the developers or the people associated with the software development. There are other companies that recognize the um, significance of the risk around code signing, and therefore they restrict code signing to just the PKI team or the InfoSec team. So I I've, uh, know one company where they have a, literally it's a locked room, with uh, one key that one or two people have access to and when they need to ha sign a piece of code, they take, uh, they unlock that room, they take a USB in with the code on it, that's where their private keys are and then they, they perform the uh, code signing operation and that's how it gets done. And when we have to ask the question, where does it get signed? And again, this is gonna be part of the problem, one of the challenges that, that, that you likely are experiencing is that if your software developers are doing it, it's gonna be signed on their laptops or their build servers, or maybe it's a web service that they're using to, to build their software or it's done in the cloud. And if the PKI team's doing it, it's like, likely to be in some secure lab or on a, a secured computer with uh, very limited people access. And so we gotta think about this from uh, terms of pros and cons. Obviously the pro for when the developers do it is that it's extremely fast. And I don't know if you hear this from your developers, if you, if you talk to them, but that's what drives them. They, they're being uh, pressured to get out new software updates more quickly than they've ever been done before. You know, it used to be that we would measure software updates by once per year, and, and then it got down to once per quarter and then once per month. And now it's not uncommon that software uh, developers are being asked to push out releases once a day or several times a day. So if you have to, if they have to rely on a single point on a PKI team, it's going to be very slow for them and, and it's going to cause problems. So that's why they want to do it themselves. But the problem with this approach is that the keys aren't secure. If you have keys that are being stored on a developer's laptop or a server or, or in the cloud, they're going to be a, a very unsafe and, and uh, accessible by potential hackers. And then if you look on the other side, uh, obviously, if you have a single point of uh, signing, it's gonna be extremely secure, but it's gonna be also very slow and that, that often doesn't work for today's business. So let's talk about some of the risks and challenges around code signing. Um, this is a great read. So if, if you wanted to find out more about code signing and the risk around it, I would suggest that, that you read this uh, very short uh, report from SANS Institute. And basically it's all about how hackers have now pivoted in their attack vectors to where they're now attacking the code signing system itself. So if you have developers with code signing keys on their laptops, hackers are gonna be searching around your network trying to find those private keys on laptops. Um, if there's a lack of process within your organization, hackers are gonna try to exploit that lack of process. And um, one of the, the great quotes from this article is that uh, it's this one that just showed popped up. It is not an exaggeration to consider private code signing keys as the keys to the business's kingdom. So let, let's think about this for a minute. If you have a TLS certificate, that's going to have a limited lifetime and it's going to be assigned to a particular uh, IP. So it's, if it's stolen, it ha can do limited damage. But with a code signing certificate and key, if the key is, uh, released, that can be used to sign any kind of software and it's gonna look like it comes from your business. 
And if your business is in the business of producing software, that's going to be a direct hit on your reputation that now people are thinking that your business is, is producing malware. Uh, the other thing about code signing keys is that when you sign a piece of software, if it's uh, time stamped, that piece of software is going to be valid. The, the code signing uh, signature is going to be valid pretty much indefinitely, as long as that timestamp is, is still valid. So that means that even if you have a breach and hackers have stolen your private code signing keys and you've tried to uh, revoke those, those certificates, if they've already signed the software, it's not going to matter because that software is out there on the internet forever, effectively, and uh, it's going to have your company's name associated with it. So very, very risky uh, from a, a security standpoint to not uh, really guard those pr private code signing keys um, with everything that you have. So particular challenges. First one is around private key sprawl and unprotected private keys. And uh, this is really, you know, the issue where we have to think about where are those keys actually being stored? You know, is it on some developer's laptop? Is it on a build server? Is it on a web server? And there's a great example of what bad can happen if you don't store these things properly. And I'll go back to that uh, uh, Zeus example. Uh, basically, this is what happened to them. They had a web update server that pushed out their driver updates to all of their customers. It was done automatically. Those updates were signed with Zeus's code signing uh, keys, and um, all the operating systems, you know, assumed that you know if they were being pushed out with a valid digitally signed update that that would just go ahead and get installed. And we see this all the time with our, our computers and laptops. What happened is that for whatever reason, Asus uh, uh, decided to keep private code signing keys on this update server. And it was probably for convenience, you know, that uh, they were rushing to get some update out and, and some developer just assumed that, hey, let's just put the key here and then I don't have to be moving software back and forth between my build environment and, and the update server. So they, they stored at least two private code signing keys on this server. And some hackers were, had broken in because the server is connected to the internet and, and uh, they were looking around and they found those private code signing keys. And they also found the updates that uh, ACES had put together. And so what they did is they just added the malware to the ACES update. They re-signed it with the valid legitimate key from ACES. And then what happens? That got pushed out to... Uh, their customers' computers who thought that it was a valid update because it was signed with a valid key and it impacted about a million computers worldwide. So again, you can see that by not protecting these keys, you really open up uh, extreme risk for hackers deal dealing with your software. So the impact to ACES was lost revenue. You can see it in their stock price when this came out. Uh, they lost market share. It was a hit on their reputation because now their, their customers were saying, can we really trust what ACES puts out? And depending on, you know, who they serve, what, what industries, there might have been some regulatory fines as well. So what are some of the other challenges around code signing? Uh, the next one is, is lack of policy enforcement. And I see this a lot, you know, that I'll be talking to an InfoSec team and I'll ask them about their code signing policies and they'll say, oh, we have a, you know, we, we've got very strict policies and uh, you know, we, don't, we don't have any concerns. And they'll show me a 30-page document that describes that. And then I'll ask the question, well, how do you enforce it? And that's where things break down. If they don't have a way to enforce that with the development teams, uh, then they, they don't really have a policy. They just have a written uh, document. Then there's also the problem around global visibility. You know, that if you're on an InfoSec team that's responsible for the security of your company and you have developers spread around the world, how do you know what they're actually doing? You know, are they following the policies that you put in place? Are they using the right kinds of code signing keys? Are they uh, following the right kinds of code signing policies and practices? Uh, you really need to have that visibility. And if you don't, that's going to mean that your company is at risk for an incident happening like it did with, uh, with the uh, Ukrainian company or, or ACES. And then finally, you have rogue software development teams. And, uh, I put rogue here in, in, in quotes, but their, their focus is not on security. Their focus is on getting updates out as quickly as possible. Security is just something they have to do. And I, I know that you've probably have heard this before. So if, if you have a policy in place that, that slows them down or it's inconvenient or it makes them do different things that they aren't normally used to doing, 
they're going to try to find ways to work around this. And we see this happening all the time with, with the companies that we talk to. So what are things that you can do? So I, you know, this sounds kind of, sounds kind of bleak, but, but there are some, some steps that you can take to make this better. The first thing that you need to do is think about code signing as a process. And it's different from a, a TLS certificate or another kind of PKI in that it's a process that involves people. So it's the people that use it. It involves things. So it's the, the code signing certificates, the code signing uh, private keys, and it's the activities. So it's, it's the build process. It's the signing process. And if any one of these things has, has a failure or a weakness, then your entire code signing process is going to be weak. So think about trying to solve this from a process perspective. And it needs to be a secure process. So how can you secure that process? First and foremost, you need to uh, have secure storage. So, you know, it, it is not acceptable to have a private code signing key on someone's laptop, desktop machine, a build server, a web server. That's just going to cause problems. So those keys have to be stored in a central location. And that, that sounds obvious, but the reason that it doesn't happen is that when, when we do move those into a central location, then it becomes inconvenient for developers and then they go rogue and, and they find ways to, to get around it. You next, you need to have the enterprise visibility. So even if you have development teams around the world, you really need to know exactly who's signing code, what certificates were used, where are the private keys at, who did the signing, who approved the signing. And that leads us to number three here, process control. And, and it's really important, especially for, for code signing credentials that are used to sign very highly critical software that your company produces, or even software that your company relies on, is to know who actually has access to use that key, under what circumstances can they use that key, who needs to approve the use of that key. If your process doesn't have a couple of approvers that are required to uh, be approve the usage of code signing key, you, you got a broken process that, that's going to uh, eventually lead to, to some some pretty significant damage. And then when we talk about process, we have to think about automation. It has to be easy to do. So if uh, you require you know, two approvers to use every code signing key, that needs to be automated. There needs to be a way that uh, people can actually follow your, your policies uh, through an automated fashion. If you require that every piece of internal code that's used gets code signed, you have to provide a very automated way of making sure those code signing certificates get issued and and eventually rotated and, and revoked. And finally, you have to have intelligence around what's going on in your company. You need to be able to show compliance that if you do have these code signing policies, that you know that everyone's following them. And you need to have visibility to, to be able to detect risky trends. Uh, let's go back to you know a development team that uses an automated build server, and that build server signs code uh, uh, once every day at 2 p.m. But if you start noticing that uh, certificate being used at 2 a.m., that's a trend that, that indicates some risk. It's out of the ordinary. And this all has to be done to where it's developer friendly. I just go back to you know, rogue software development teams. They're, if there's a way for them to work around what, what you need to have done, they will if it's not easy for them. So, and when we talk about it being easy for them, it needs to not slow them down. It needs to work with their existing tools and processes. And it doesn't require for them to have PKI experience because they, they often do not have that. And uh, the last thing I just wanted to leave you with is uh, if you wanted to read more about best practices, there's this great uh, piece from NIST that's uh, security considerations for code signing. So if you wanted to look at how you can improve the, uh, the code signing situation at your company, uh, this, this, this article would definitely uh, be helpful there. And I just wanted to thank you all for your time. Uh, this has uh, been really nice to be able to participate in this, and I'm happy to, to answer any questions. Hey, so this is Yvette. Um, if you want to go into Slack and go and connect, um, there's been some questions popping up. Um, if you want to go and glance at those and maybe have some conversations. Um, I'm going to keep us on schedule or try to keep us on schedule. I know I was, I ran over a little bit and you got started a little bit late. So I was trying not to cut you off and let you have all the time that you needed for your presentation. But I know, um, it's important to keep us on schedule. So if you want to go into Slack and, um, ask Eddie some questions and maybe give him some, um, comments about his presentation. We really appreciate you showing up today and getting up early and <laughs> presenting. 
um, at B-Sides Atlanta. It's um, very helpful and important to us and we appreciate your time. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, you're right, uh, the first comment here from Frank, code signing is not a panacea, particularly when the supply chain is predominantly open source. But this is, this is what you can use code signing for in, in that particular situation is that uh, presumably your development organization working with your organization, when they start to use open source software, they run it through whatever test uh, and security uh, tests that, that you, you deem is necessary and required. And once uh, you've uh, deemed this particular piece of open source software in a you know, source code, then sign it so that you know that no one on your team or in, in your organization can actually modify that if they aren't supposed to. And uh, so we, we have customers that are signing, you know, multiple aspects, you know, they're, uh, if they're getting source code in from a third party, they sign that when they receive it after they run it through their test. If they're using libraries from a third party, after they run their test, they sign it so that they know it at no point does that get, um, uh, get changed or modified by either a, a malicious employee or a, a third party that's broken into your network. But yes, I agree. It's, it's not a, not a solve all, but, um, but definitely it can go a long way to helping prevent the problem that Maersk had and, and, uh, and even ASUS. I mean, ASUS is a great example where they just literally did not protect their keys. And can I get the name of the article that you recommend again? It's, uh, I mentioned two, one was a NIST, uh, article on security considerations. Uh, then the other article was from the SANS Institute about uh, uh, code signing uh, security concerns. But uh, thank you very much. I know I am over now. So uh, if you have other questions, feel free to reach out to me uh, either through Slack or Twitter or, or my email address. Thanks, Eddie. We appreciate yeah. it. Thank you.